Hello everyone, so since the beginning of the channel, since our first episode, we've been on a series trying to design a replacement for my uh, old headphone amplifier, this little uh, Simoy clone. And in today's episode, we are actually <laughs> going to show for the first time the final schematic that's going to be uh, at least one channel off the amplifier without the power supply and all that stuff, because that's for the next episode. So first of all, let's do a little bit of a recap in this series. We've gone through the specifications, we did all the transistor selection, we went through some theory to learn about more about things like the very basic stuff like the emitter follower, current sinks and sources, then we did the common emitter amplifier design and in this episode we are finally going to combine everything, literally everything that we've seen so far into a single circuit which will eventually be one channel of the finished headphone amplifier. So let's take a look at that. So this is the circuit that we are going to be working with. Let me just zoom a bit in so you can see this better. So after nine videos, we are more than capable of just looking at this and identifying all the, the circuit building blocks that we've been seeing so far. So let's start by doing just that. So here, in this portion of the circuit, we have a simple current, scene, current source. So let's just write this here. We have our current source. Now, down here, what we have is a simple uh, common emitter, common emitter, amplifier, single transistor, okay? Now, that is coupled into an emitter follower, which has its uh, emitter quote marks because we're using a um, complementary feedback pair coupled to a simple current sink. So right off the bat, uh, what you can clearly see is that this circuit, as soon as you look at it the first time, it kind of looks a bit daunting, it kind of looks a bit complex, but since we have seen every single one of these, these blocks before and in depth. Now when you look at it, you can quickly just notice the building blocks and you can kind of just start to substitute them by the, the, their, uh, their like names, like the current source and stuff like that. And you can see that it's a lot simpler than you might imagine. Everything that we have here is just an, a voltage amplifying stage and a current amplifying stage. This current sink, we could have just used a resistor. This current source, same thing. What have we done here? We've just used this current sinks and sources just to make sure that we get the best performance possible. Now that we have uh, identified all of our building blocks, let me grab a new sheet and uh, there we are actually going to talk a bit more about the circuit itself. I just want to do this little thing just so that you can understand why we had nine videos previous to this so that we could get to this stage and know fully well that everything that's in here we fully understand. Okay, so let me just grab that sheet right here. Now let's dissect the circuit a little bit. So first of all, the main part of the circuit is going to be our voltage amplification stage which is right here. As we've seen in the previous video, we done, we've uh, selected shunt feedback, a single common emitter transistor in shunt feedback. So the output is right here. Since this is a, a single supply amplifier, we have a decoupling capacitor. I've also added this resistor right here, which is the same as this R2 right here at the input. These resistors just make sure that whenever you have absolutely nothing here plugged into either of these uh, connections. This point is always referenced ground by a yeah, high value resistor. Because the thing is, if this resistor wasn't here, what you get is whenever you plug in either an input or something in the output, you get like a loud pop, like as you see in uh, a bunch of amplifiers. That's because these capacitors, they get charged 
and when you connect something, it discharges through that path to ground. This way, it's always, it's, it's always charged because there is always a voltage here, but this node is always referenced to ground, so whenever you plug something in, it just doesn't go and uh, uh, discharges via that. Okay? So, now, if we look here, this is the DC output, the output which uh, has DC superimposed to it. This is basically just an emitter follower, which is uh, buffering the output of this uh, voltage amplification stage. This way we can provide a much lower uh, output impedance for our load, but also this provides a low impedance for our feedback network, so that it isn't affected by the biasing, the, not the biasing, sorry, the current that we've set for the um, common emitter uh, stage, okay? Now, just like in the previous video, it's basically these, the same um, layout as before. Remember, this is just for the prototype. I will make some changes to this when I decide to go to the final circuit, which is going to be uh, in a proper printed circuit board. Now, these resistors, just because I didn't have any like 8K resistor, which would be the perfect size for this. So I just had to make do with this. In the final project, I'm going to be using a potentiometer here, because that way I can just set the midpoint and make sure that I always have the best uh, voltage here, so that it allows me to have the greatest voltage swing possible. So always use a potentiometer here. Um, now, as you can see, by this arrangement, oh, I've also added this capacitor since our last circuit. This is just a 10 picofarad capacitor. You can leave this out. I just added it just so that uh, we are not trying to amplify uh, high frequencies. So that if someone puts, for example, a source that uh, has, let's say, a signal at uh, 80 kilohertz, that's just noise. Let's not amplify that and not um, waste power doing that. So that's just a uh, low impedance path for those high frequencies. Um, what can I say here? So the amplification, it's basically uh, 6.8 times of amplification here. Pretty simple stuff. Uh, so yeah, there, there's nothing much to talk about in here. So let me just annotate some things. I've decided to go with two milliamps of current to our uh, common emitter stage. The output stage is operating at, uh, with this resistor here, is operating at around uh, 70 milliamps, around 70, um, 65, 70 milliamps with a 10 ohm resistor here. This VB is usually at around like 650 to 0.7. So with 70 milliamps, we can easily drive a low impedance headphone, like for example, a 16 ohm headphone with a, a one volt peak to peak signal, which is going to be more than enough for that sort of a headphone. Easily, as well, since we have a 12 volt supply and all the, the, the open loop gain to do that, we can also drive, for example, my Sennheiser HD650s, which have a 300 ohm um, impedance, because this can easily go to higher voltages and provide, there's just more than enough current for that, okay? So it's, it's pretty simple. The frequency response of this is basically flat from 20 hertz, 20 kilohertz. Um, there is really like not much to say, like all of these, all of these capacitors, for example, I chose like a 1000 microfarad capacitor here. That's just because I really wanted to support the, those uh, 16 ohm headphones, just in case. But if this was going to be uh, just for my headphones, just this 300 ohm, I could make this, this capacitor just a lot smaller. So it's just those, those kinds of things. This capacitor in the final circuit, I'm going to put a proper uh, film capacitor in here. So just don't bother with that. Just again, this is just for prototyping. Now what I want to show you is this. Let me just focus on it. So this is the circuit that you've seen right here, but in a little like homemade PCB. 
So I use the toner transfer method, just so if anyone's curious. Silk screen, same stuff, just toner transfer. Now, one thing that I forgot, because this, this kind of stuff always happens, when I was uh, simulating the circuit and uh, designing it, everything was fine, but then like I forgot about something that's pretty basic, which I incidentally didn't talk about in our um, uh, emitter follower video. But if you look here, and if you look at any literature regarding uh, emitter followers, they all say that this uh, topology not the complementary feedback pattern, whenever you have like a emitter follower type of topology, you're always prone to oscillations. And it's something that you always have to keep in mind when you're designing something like this. But that's why I always build prototypes. Because when you're designing something like this, you especially when you're doing it in simulation, just want to make sure that everything is fine. You usually forget about stuff like oscillations. But then it really kicks you in the butt when you actually build it. Now, so what I had to do to mitigate this. This thing was oscillating at around 21 megahertz, which is horrible. So I had to tame that down. And what you usually do is very simple. First of all, one of the things, if your um, output stage or any sort of emitter follower is oscillating, add a base stopper resistor. So in the base of the emitter follower, just add a resistor right here. Pretty simple stuff. In this case, I added a 330 ohm. Just since the design already had one, I went with that. So I put a 330 ohm resistor right there. The other thing that you should always put in any amplifier, be it a headphone amplifier or a power amplifier, you should always put a Zobel network. This is what's called a Zobel network this little thing right here so let me see if i can show it it's a bodge but hey this is why you build prototypes so right here at the dc input what you do is you put a resistor followed by a capacitor to ground okay in this case my resistor is 10 ohms and this is 0.1 microfarad so this is just like a bunch of like usual values. Uh, so if anyone wants, I can in the in the next videos uh, maybe do some simulations with this, and also explain a bit about the theory of how these work, and maybe just do some, uh, for example, some MATLAB uh, calculations and stuff like that so on how to choose the optimum uh, resistor and capacitor combination. Hey, that's for the next video. So just. Keep in mind that whenever you're building an amplifier like this, it's going to be driving, in this case, a very uh, heavy either capacitive, inductive load, or when you have an emitter follower, just keep this in mind that you'll probably have some oscillations. In this case, I had, and I completely forgot to add these components, but hey, again, this is why you build prototypes. So now with this resistor here in this Zobel network at the output, this is completely oscillation free. So, now that we've discussed a bit about the circuit, simple stuff, if you have any uh, um, questions about it, any suggestions or recommendations, whatever, just leave them in the comments and I'll address them. Uh, so right now, let's jump on over to some measurements so that we can categorize the DC, the AC operating point, and also the distortion figures, uh, some preliminary distortion figures for uh, this circuit before we actually move on to the next phase, which is designing this power supply and building a proper PCB for this, okay? So let me just rearrange stuff here and I'll be right back. So let's start by taking some measurements of the DC operating point of the amplifier. So first of all, the whole amplifier is drawing around 80 milliamps or thereabouts. Our supply voltage is at a healthy 12 volts, as we've seen in the previous videos. Now, let's start by probing, for example, the output right here, DC output. It should be around like a bit more than uh, the 
midpoint of the power supply, the half supply. Oh, and it isn't, it's a bit high, so this is because of uh, this non optimal resistor here. This, in theory, should be a bit uh, higher, around like 8.2, but I didn't have 8.2k, but I didn't have any of those in stock. Also, in the final amplifier, we are just going to put a potentiometer here anyway, so let's not care about that. And the way to set that potentiometer, just um, uh, put an input signal where it starts to clip and just adjust this so that it stops clipping and just continue doing that until you're basically, no matter how you, you um, adjust the trimmer here, you will always just start clipping either at the positive side or at the negative side of the sine wave. Now, after that tangent, just let's check the output right here after the, the DC output point. So the output right here should be at zero volts, and well, it is. Now, let's probe some things also. Like here, we have R11. This is going to be a resistor that's going to be setting the um, output current, the maximum output current. So R11. Oh, R11 is right here. Here we go. So if we probe one side of R11, our VB there is at around 627 millivolts. Nice. So we are having around uh, 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 65 milliamps flowing through there. Also, like this LED is also robbing us some of the current. So that's why the current seems a bit high at the, at the multimeter that's actually measuring the whole circuit current. But just keep that in mind. Some of the, most of the current it's not flowing through the, the first stage right here. Here we only have two amps, two milliamps. Some of it's also flowing through the LED. So let's just check this right here. So uh, let's probe this node right here. Should have one VB there. As you can see, yeah, one VB there. And that VB is at around um, 650 millivolts. So we have uh, around two milliamps flowing through the, the uh, voltage amplification stage, the common emitter. So yeah, like this is this is working quite now. So, some something that we also can uh, probe, which is quite interesting, if we probe this point right here, the base of Q4, which should have the DC output plus one VB. So let me probe the DC output again. The DC output. Oh, and I just shorted the power supply. Nice. Uh, the DC output is at um, 6.6 .6 volts. Now the base of the transistor should be at 7.2 volts. So yeah, we have like a 0.6 volt drop there. So that's nice. So as we've seen in the previous episodes, this this sort of stuff, it's, it's very simple. There's not much there. And uh, it really just works. It's a simple circuit. It's a minimalistic circuit. And if you design it properly, it will work right out of the, out of the box as you've seen here. So now I'll rearrange this again and we're going to be looking at the AC uh, operating point of this. I'm going to be looking a bit at the gain. So let me do that. Let me fire up the oscilloscope, the signal generator, and I'll be right back. I was about to rearrange the bench when I remembered there was one thing that we did measure which is very important, which is the dissipation of uh, these transistors right here. Uh, first of all, we can measure like their dissipation. I think it was at, uh, we can calculate, I mean, dissipation. I think they were at 6.6 uh, .6 volts. Okay, so let's just do that for the, the lower resistor, the lower transistor, this one, Q7. So just go like this, 6.6, .6, 0 0.6, which is the VB, the VB drop, which is in the emitter. So we have 6 volts across it times our 7 milliamps. So we have almost half a watt flowing through it, which is not much. You can uh, calculate the, the temperature difference. It's going to have dissipating half a watt basing, based on the thermal resistance that's in the data sheet. But hey, it's already built up here. So 
we can, in fact, measure it. So let's do just that. So first of all, I can just literally be a hit sink to these transistors. They are not hot at all. They're just warm when you touch them. I can just do this all day. Now let's bring here another multimeter. And let's measure our temperature. Oh, by the way, uh, the polarizing filter is acting up. <laughs> oh, anyway, just, just disregard this rainfall right here. So, we are at a very pleasant uh, 21 degrees. Now let's measure the bottom transistor, which in this case is going to be dissipating most of the power because of the imbalance. And yeah, but so yeah, it's at a so quiet, but hey, uh, it's at around like 37, 38 degrees C, so not much in the final design. We don't need to heat sink them. If I want, I'll just put one of those like tiny heat sinks that you, you buy on a Fresnel or DG key and put them in just for good measure. But hey, they are perfectly capable of doing the job without heat sinking. So after that uh, brief interruption, let's go back to uh, measuring the AC parameters. Now that I've rearranged the bench, let's do some measurements. First of all, this looks a bit messy, okay? But bear with me for a moment. So we have the input right here, and here's the output going to the oscilloscope. The output is terminated with a uh, 330 ohm resistor, just to provide a load. This is going to be uh, mimicking the um, uh, the my headphones, which are around 300 ohm input impedance. Now, what we have is a one volt peak to peak uh, sine wave at one kilohertz going to the input. And what we have out is a seven volt peak to peak sine wave. So we have a very nice gain of a seven times. It's, it's like, I'm really amazed. It's spot on <laughs> seven volts. So yeah, this is, this is quite remarkable, <laughs> the tolerances here that uh, went into play, but hey, okay. <laughs> Should have been 6.8, got 7, so the tolerances for the first time rounded something up. <laughs> now, this is at 1 kilohertz. Now let's take a look at, uh, for example, 500 hertz. At uh, 500 hertz, we still have the 7 volts peak to peak signal, so great, no attenuation there. Let's go down to 100 hertz. 100 hertz, basically the same thing. This are just probably just some uh, um, sampling errors in the oscilloscope, I'm measuring a bit higher, but I, it's probably just seven volts again. Now let's go down like, let's say 50 hertz at uh, 50 hertz. Uh, we're starting to get some attenuation, so 6.95 and at the very bottom end, at 20 hertz, we get a, a little bit more attenuation at 6.76 uh, volts. This is not due to the output capacitor, because our output capacitor of a um, thousand microfarad is just uh, more than enough, even for a uh, 16 ohm load, not the 330 ohm load that we have here that wouldn't be uh, contributing to this attenuation. This attenuation is due to our input capacitor being um, 4.7 microfarad and having an, and if this, since this circuit has a input impedance of 10K, that's playing up a bit. If you, I, I don't mind this little attenuation, but if you mind this, just bump this up, let's say for like a 10 microfarads and you'll be all right, okay? Now let's start going up. Let's go to uh, let's go to five kilohertz, and look what we have there. At five kilohertz, seven volts still. Ten kilohertz, seven volts. Twenty kilohertz, uh, just a tiny bit of attenuation, very little, six point nine six, still like seven seven times gain. So the circuit is pretty much flat across the whole uh, audio spectrum. <laughs> That's great, let's just bump this. Let's see how it does at 30 kilohertz. 
Still very little attenuation. 40 kilohertz. 50 kilohertz. Yeah, like at around like 40 kilohertz, it starts to, to drop off a bit at 6.8. And from there on, it just drops off dramatically. This is 180 kilohertz. 250 kilohertz. And by now, <laughs> we're starting to see this is not a sine wave anymore. This is due to our um, the gain of the amplifier and also all the non-linearities at play here. So yeah, it's, it's not a fast amplifier. That's for sure. This is no op amp. <laughs> but hey, it's, uh, it's okay. It's, uh, it's producing a pretty reasonable signal. This is at uh, 50 kilohertz and at uh, 20 kilohertz, which is actually what we want. It's mighty fine. So now let's stop looking at the oscilloscope. You've already seen what we have here. It's pretty flat. Let's take a look at the distortion because I have a distortion analyzer here in the lab. So let's take a look at that and see if this circuit, this very minimalist circuit, actually um, works quite well and uh, <laughs> provides us with an acceptable level of distortion. Okay, let me rearrange again and I'll see you in a bit. So uh, sorry for the <laughs> horrible image quality. I really didn't want to uh, upset the, the whole uh, um, recording rig. So I just went with my uh, little GoPro, okay? So also the audio might be a little bit different because I'm recording to the recorder, not directly to the camera. But hey, so this is my HP 331A. It's a distortion analyzer, a bolt anchor. I had to also put some uh, more lighting here just so that this looks a bit better. But oh, so let's let's start with this, okay? Um, I, I've already recorded this, but uh, my my old other GoPro, the original one, this is just a Chinese knockoff. My original one just decided it didn't want to record, okay? <laughs> so bear with me for a moment. But hey, I've already <laughs> set this all up. This is already measuring the THD of the circuit at. Uh, one kilohertz right so this is it right here it's at the 0.1 percent scale and it's measuring around uh 0.06 percent thd at one kilohertz so that's extremely nice so now let's do some measurements for um the other uh known like standard frequencies okay so bear with me for a moment I've set the signal generator to generate a hundred hertz. So let's see. I'm in the previous version that I tried to film with the other GoPro. I set this all up on camera, just so you know how to use this kind of equipment. Hey, since I lost that footage, let's do it here for hundred kilohertz for hundred hertz. So it's at a ten times ten here. So ten times ten, hundred. So it's around a hundred hertz. So. It's at the set level, so let's adjust this for full scale deflection. Okay, so now let's switch to distortion, and I'll just have to uh, twiddle with the frequency knob and the balance knob until we have a uh, the lowest point here of distortion. Okay, so I'm probably going to do a time lapse since this is a bit boring, and I'll uh, I'll get back to you. When I've already had a, a, a result, okay? So, I uh, have uh, finished measuring the 100 hertz. So, at 100 hertz, we have around 0.05% THD. Again, pretty respectable and and a very important thing is that it's flat up until now, so 1 kilohertz and 100 hertz, exactly the same, 0.05%. Nice. So one thing that you should also keep in mind that I forgot to mention, um, my signal generator, the Rigel DG1022A, uh, if I plug it straight into here, I get a reading of around a 0.025% THD. So it's not a, the cleanest signal ever, but it's what I have. This is just so that we can have a, an idea of the THE and it's oh, more than acceptable, less than 0.1%. It, 
it's <laughs> it's indistinguishable you can't hear any distortion below that so nice so now let's jump on over to the other extreme let's go to 20 kilohertz okay let me set that up and redo the whole thing so just set this whole thing up for 20 kilohertz there it is and if we look over here it's not perfect we are at the 0.3% um, scale and so you have to read this bottom one not the top one and if you look right here we are at uh, around 0.13 uh, 0.14 percent so that's not ideal ideally i just i want it to be uh below uh, 0.1 percent but hey this is good enough seriously uh at these levels at 20 kilohertz uh 0 0.13 percent of distortion it's not much so yeah <laughs> let's just deal with it this is a minimalist circuit so i was already expecting not a terrific uh distortion values at 20 kilohertz but hey let's uh let's take a look at uh 10 kilohertz just so that we see that uh if this gets a little bit better down there all right Now, at uh, around 10 kilohertz, what we have is a, a much better picture, <laughs> much better audio in this case. Uh, you're back at the 0.1% um, full scale, so that's 0.1%, and we are um, getting almost 0.08% distortion, so it's hovering, it's just a goes back and forth between like 0 0.075 and 0 0.08. So at 10 kilohertz, we get much better distortion figures. Uh, just so that we can uh, get a bit more of a, a clear picture of this, let's go to uh, 15 kilohertz, shall we? Let's take a look what we have there. Now for uh, 15 kilohertz, what we have here, so we are at the 0.3% scale, so you should be looking at the, the scale down here, and we are almost spot on at uh, 0 .9, 0 0.095, 0 0.1%, yeah, at 15 kilohertz with a circuit that is this simple. This is really great, okay? You're uh, right smack dab at a 0.1%. Again, pretty acceptable. So yeah, that's a that's that's pretty remarkable for a simple circuit like this. Now, just for fun, let's take a look at uh, 20 hertz, okay? So now for a venerable 20 hertz, hey, we are getting a distortion of, uh, oh, by the way, we are at the 0.1% scale. It's flickering around a little bit because of the noise here in the room. <laughs> at these uh, low um, frequencies, noise becomes a really serious problem, especially with uh, mains interference. And uh, cables are not ideal here. I need to. Uh, I didn't have any coaxial cables to prepare for this um, experiment, <laughs> so and I didn't want to go out. So there you go. So this is just again, this is just a little quick test. Anyway, so um, we're getting a, around 0.07 percent at 20 hertz, which is great. So yeah, all in all, the circuit's pretty flat. Starts to uh, get a little bit more distortion. Um, above um, 15 kilohertz, but that's fine given the circuit. So yeah, <laughs> this is pretty interesting to test out. So let me uh, clean up the bench and let's uh, end the video, okay? So that was a lot of fun. <laughs> hey, our little circuit here, 
it works it works extremely well as we've seen in the distortion analyzer we get pretty much less than a 0.1 percent distortion across the board when it starts to get near 20 kilohertz things starts to uh, to uh, go up but hey it's all in all with a, a circuit as simple as this it could be even simpler you could replace this um, constant uh, current sink here with just a resistor eliminating two uh, transistors in the process and I'm pretty sure you wouldn't get any um, performance degradation from that yeah, I just wanted to use the current sink here since that way I can just set the midpoint bias here to any value that I want and um, in that case the current will stay the same with a resistor you gotta choose the resistor to your optimum bias point here but hey that's just me um, even if you put a resistor here with just a what few with all in all like a four so seven transistors you got a pretty nice little amp headphone amplifier you could uh, scale this up to a power amplifier no problems whatsoever just uh, keep in mind the resistors you have to change and the transistor that you have to put some much beefier stuff but hey got pretty good um a pretty pretty good frequency response pretty good distortion uh, values this is perfectly acceptable for uh, everyday use. This is not audiophile foolishness and stuff like that. This is a, uh, a very much like objective circuit to be minimalistic and extract as much performance as possible from something that's simple to understand. This is clearly, uh, if you've seen the previous videos, this is just super simple to understand because we've seen all of the building blocks to get to this point right here. This is not one of those like a uh, ultra minimalist circuits that uses like uh, <laughs> non uh, non trivial <laughs> circuits to get the most uh, performance out of them. This is simple to understand, <laughs> especially after all those videos. So yeah, like this is pretty nice. Uh, I really wanted to have a less than 0.1 percent distortion across the board, but hey, you can't have it all. But there's one thing I didn't uh, put in the video just because <laughs> I didn't want to make it uh, ultra long. But when I uh, tested the circuit for um, as if it was with a uh, low impedance headphone, I put a uh, 33 ohm resistor here and set the output voltage to be at around 1 volt peak to peak, which is the common output of most uh, headphone jacks out there for from a mobile phone and stuff like that and I started measuring the THD and it was flat across the board from 20 Hertz up until uh, 20 kilohertz I was getting 0.065 percent which is absolutely terrific so if you want to drive this circuit uh, with a with a, a regular headphone at the output this circuit is just Great in terms of distortion you get absolutely nothing there uh, the circuit could benefit a bit from a uh, uh, nudging this voltage here I think with nudge this voltage here and uh, um, improve some some uh, of the circuit we could shave off like a, a 0.1 percent 0 0.01 0 0.02 percent off of the THD at 20 kilohertz with the output set at uh, 6 volts peak to peak into the 300 ohm load but hey I'm perfectly fine with the way it is right here so I'm going to leave this one here uh, this was a ton of fun um, now that we've uh, set the, the circuit right here the amplification stage we're going to start looking into the power supply we're going to do some transformer selection I'm going to do some. Uh, I'm going to design a really like overkill power supply for this, <laughs> just because I can. It's a. Uh, it's the fun of doing stuff like this. If you if you're doing DIY audio, it's all about fun. D d don't care about like stuff like uh, um, optimizing everything and uh, just making sure. Hey, I like to optimize everything. <laughs> That's how I have fun. Hey, you do you. Um, don't think about oh I I want to have the lowest distortion possible. Hey just 
do what you can and have fun doing it okay now in the next episode it's probably going to be <laughs> starting on the power supply side of things we're going to, as i said in the i think it was the first video we'll be doing a uh building a uh, shunt power supply for this since hey if we're doing class a let's go all the way and just waste tons of power <laughs> yeah so that's going to be fun and uh yeah this was it if you have any questions please leave them in the comments below if you have any suggestions recommendations whatever for future videos hey also very welcome um and yeah i'm going to leave this one here we had some pretty good uh, measurements had some fun and uh let's start with the power supply stuff so see you in the next one Bye.